Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today, we have back the CEO, Nick Blitterswick from UGE International. UGE trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol UGE, and it also trades on the OTC under UGEIF. The company's currently trading at about $1.40 with roughly 33 million shares outstanding or about a $46.5 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Yeah, thanks a lot, Trevor. Uh, good to have you back, Nick. It's been a little while since we spoke. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, Likewise. Yeah, perfect. Um, listen, a lot, lots going on. Obviously, uh, UGE, a story that uh, we're fairly familiar with, um, but we've, you know, we've got a lot of new subscribers, a lot of new members that uh, might not be uh, familiar. So, you know, before we jump into questions and update, why don't you, uh, why don't you sort of give us a lay of the land? What, what's the company's all about, and then. Uh, more importantly, uh, what uh, what should get us all excited? Yeah, sounds good. No, great to see you again, Paul and Trevor, and, and thanks for uh, thanks for having us back on. So, um, I know there's a, a few slides that are up on the screen right now. Just to give you, just to go uh, through it real quickly. Um, I know several people on the call will be familiar with the story already, but in case you're not, we are a full lifecycle developer of, of mid scale or distribution level. Uh, renewable energy or solar projects in the U.S. Um, so we're we're developing, we're building up this portfolio of these types of assets. Um, we we've been we've been doing this for give or take 14 years, but in the last couple of years, pivoted to the IPP model, sort of building up our own our own portfolio. Um, and I'll go through a few slides here shortly that that just show how much the portfolio is ramping up this year. Um, you know, I mentioned on there the the second bullet point about 12% unlevered after tax IRRs, just to give a sense of like. The type of unlevered returns these types of projects generate. Um, I'll go through also, we're, we're much more cash flow driven as a business. So I'll go through a slide a little bit later just on, on how those numbers work out and how those numbers are scaling as the portfolio matures here. Um, and, then, and then lastly, you know, we're operating in a space that has a tremendous amount of tailwinds. Um, I think I, I even go out there to say that uh, like tailwinds that are really underappreciated in the market right now. Um, in place Reduction Act was the the biggest bill any country has passed in the in the you know the history of renewable energy. Um, it's still filtering down to um, to to the industry. I was actually at lunch today with one of the lenders we work with who was talking about you know this this twenty seven billion dollar pot of money, just like a small piece of IRA, and how all that money is uh, going to flow next year to all these lenders that we work with, and how they're going to be scrambling for projects to fund. Uh, Etc. So you know a lot more we can get into there, but you know right place, right time with all the experience that we have, the types of projects we do, the profitability of our portfolio, um, and and these tailwinds in the industry. So you know again, I know that uh, several people on the call will be familiar with the story already. W one thing that I just wanted to kind of bring back to ground is just how fast the company is growing right now. Um, you know, for those who have followed, I I'd have to check, but I think pro pro probably Paul and Trevor. Uh, you probably had us on for the first time, maybe two years ago, give or take. Uh, and, you know, that was at the beginning of this IPP transition um, here in 2023. And of course, the year is almost done. So these numbers are, are almost fully baked at this point. Um, NTP growth this year, that's the that's when projects are fully developed, ready just to be built and then turned on. The growth is 19x this year. Um, so 19 times as many megawatts hitting NTP this year as last year. Still a long way to go to where we want to get to, and, and the backlog is going to provide a nice steady stream of those going forward, but um, pretty pretty significant, obviously, in terms of how much uh, that's grown. Um, those, those projects, as they reach commercial operations, so our portfolio, the operating portfolio, will grow almost 3x this year. Um, it's still, uh, again, small versus like the 100 megawatt medium-term goal that we have that we're working towards, but as all those NTPs that I showed in the last slide reach commercial operation in the, the months and quarters to come, and then all the NTPs that we bring forth uh, next year as well, we'll see this operating portfolio grow um, at a, an even higher rate actually in 2024 um, and continue growing onward from there. And, and so, you know, the NTP and the COD, we'll come back to why this is important in a, in a moment, but the NTP really is when we start turning cash flow positive on projects and taking out what we call a, a developer surplus. And then COD is where the income statement really starts to ramp up and we get that decades of, 
high margin recurring revenue that, that comes from it. Um, I focus on those first because that's really where the rubber hits the road, but the, the early stage uh, pipeline and the backlog are both growing at a really good rate too. Um, so this is, uh, we, we report our Q3s week after next, but um, in the meantime, this is year over year, Q2 this year versus Q2 last year. So the early stage pipeline um, grew 2.7x. And then if I zoom in on the, the later stage, um, and I, uh, yeah, later stage backlog, that's two and a half X. So these are, uh, I'll, I'll save all the detail, but these are all stages that we report uh, in, in our MDNA each year. So, you know, this one in particular, if you look at that blue, like dark bluish gray color, um, you see these are the projects that have interconnection approval, um, are either at the very, very end of development or, or already in construction, already in operation. So you're seeing that shift move, move through. Um, Two two other things I wanted to briefly touch on. So, so like this, the the scaling up of the company is 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 exciting, or we're really excited about that. Um, the there's a big um, focus within the company right now of um, of uh, of like you know, building the flywheel is 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 the mantra that we talk about internally, but sort of like all the sort of unsexy parts of scaling, right? So processes and systems and forecasting and measurement and KPIs. Things like that. So, you know, we um we we brought on uh, Brandon as our COO in this past summer, and 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 he's been a really fantastic addition to the team. Uh, I think that probably on our webinar a couple of weeks from now for our Q threes, we'll, we'll we'll invite Brandon on there, and he can talk a bit about these types of things that he's working on right now as well. Um, but just you know, really really pleased with how the teams come together, the structure of the team, um, how we're how we're doing a better job of using tools, etc. Uh, you know, making sure that flows down to uh, you know accurate forecasting in the top right there, making sure that we have a really good grasp on those timelines, and um, especially as a public company, that that going forward we're uh, we're we're meeting or exceeding those timelines that we're sharing. So, uh, you know, I won't go into more detail on that right now. I'm happy, of course, to talk about it in the Q and A, but um, a lot of work that's going into that. And then, um, lastly, and you know, this this slide is from our investor presentation. So, folks familiar with the company probably are familiar with it. Um, this just talks about how cash flows through the the projects and the portfolio. Um, because this year is is so focused on the the ramp up of um, of, of projects, this this right here is from the presentation as well. But this uh, this really drives home the the sort of like the pickup and improvement of cash flows in the company uh, as as we build up more projects. So this is for main projects um, that uh, actually one one's already operational, the other one's going to be operational. Um, uh, hopefully next week, U.S. Thanksgiving may, may delay that a couple of days, but very close. And then uh, the other two are, are, are still uh, in construction. But um, so this is these four projects in Maine. And so like in this case, in the development period, we only invested about 320,000, started developing those projects, uh, I think some of them in 2019, the rest in 2020. Um, and then as we hit NTP on those and start building them out, we actually take out cash of this uh, 4.7 million, uh, this, this developer surplus, um, and then the, the, those projects are projected to earn average recurring revenue, 1.6 million per year. Those projects, 35 years, and our gross margins on recurring revenue have been um, 90 percent. I think we're guiding a little bit below that, like 85, but um, you know, very high margin gross, uh, very high gross margin um, recurring revenue that will come out from that as well. So I think it kind of drives home the profitability of the business as it as it scales. Um, you know, one other point I will say, and this is going to be brushing across the surface here, um, but I know that. Like for a for a microcap company, our our financial statements can be a little bit hard to follow, frankly. Um, and so, like in our, our our income statement wouldn't show that cash flow. Our, our cash flow statement would, uh, but because we're in essence um, taking those proceeds out of the incentives, the tax credit, um, the the proceeds of financing those projects, it's actually sort of uh, it, yeah, it's accretive to cash flow, but not to the income statement. So I can go into that in more detail uh, mm -hmm. in Q and A if we like, but. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited about how the business is uh, really turning the corner here in 2023. So um, with that, Paul, um, I'll, I'll stop sharing the deck, but I can bring it back up if you ever want me to there. And I feel free to keep the deck up as, as it is right now. Um, you know, I want to remind everybody, uh, if you've got questions for Nick, please use the chat function and uh, I'll ask the question. I, I see a couple have already come in. And um, like I, I've had some questions in the past just revolving around um, the, the company and how it's funding these projects. So you, you really get some some interesting ways that you're funding it through these green bonds and and project financing. Why, why don't you why don't we just uh, sort of dive into some of the details here? What's the difference between a green bond 
and then project direct financing. Yeah, in uh, you actually, you know, I'm glad I kept this um, this this slide up because it really helps answer that question right there. If uh, on the left hand side, the uh, you know the we invested 320k, um, that's direct project investment. We of course have our overhead uh, uh, for the company as well. But in essence, if we look at this, the during the black period, that's where we raise green bonds to fund development and overhead. Um, we call them project development green bonds. Um, I think pretty well aligned with the types of investors we work with in that. Like there's a huge impact story that they're investing directly in bringing these projects to fruition. Um, so the green bonds are, 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 are in that time period. So it says here two to three years. Uh, we, we, the issuance we, uh, we, we just closed was a, a five-year bond callable after three years. So we can kind of cycle, cycle projects through that development time period. Um, and then once projects get to NTP, the... Um, this is where like traditional project financing is 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 a plenty. Um, so this really primarily boils down to we work with traditional banks on construction to term. So the 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 lime green would be the construction project reaches commercial operation. It it automatically pivots into uh, a perm note, um, and then the tax equity, which is monetizing that tax credit, uh, will have milestones during that NTP phase. Uh, and then, um, and then that'll be fully paid in by the time we we get to that plus sign. Um, so, and and then like so, those sources, the construction plus the tax equity, the reason we're able to pay ourselves back this uh, this developer surplus, as we refer to it as, is because of the excess of of, of money we're bringing in. Um, kind of goes down to incentives and the the the, the value of that tax credit. So, um, yeah. So you know, that was kind of a high level summary about how we go through mm -hmm. that. But um, but you know, it, it, what it's meant, I think, is no, number one is um, you know good good access to to low cost capital to fund those projects long term, the 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 size of that developer surplus you know we haven't raised equity in just under three years now and and it's not not on our radar um, and uh, and then also like the size of that backlog size of the portfolio the the value of those assets is also providing really good collateral for us on that on that green bond side which has been a nice fuel for uh, for for development there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and so it's it sounds like that's why it's so important to really watch the cash flow statements because you you guys are in essence able to to draw cash out, um, not necessarily through income, but because you're you're getting funded the way you are, that that cash is starting to show up on your uh, your cash flow statement. That's right. And yeah. So if if you look at our Q1 this year, the the Q1 this year was cash flow positive. Q2 mm -hmm. was was not quite. Um, and that speaks to the volume of NTPs we had in in Q1. Um, so you know we're we're flirting with that level right now. Um, we'll 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 get over that level here. Uh, I, I think um, on a consistent basis. I'm pretty confident within 2024. But um, but yeah, no, exactly. And I think you no, know, we we understand we're a bit of a complicated uh, mm -hmm. you know, story to follow in that regard. So we'll continue to 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 try to refine our messaging and our financial statements to try to you know the MDNA in particular to try to pull that out for people mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you talked about backlog and, and sort of the, the the financing capability off that backlog. What what is that number? I can't remember if I saw it here. Um, like, like what 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 level of debt can you get off your backlog right now? Yeah, you know this. If I go back to the prior slide, it doesn't actually perfectly speak to it. Mm -hmm. um, this will actually undershoot it by a significant margin. But that, um, but just if we use very rough math, you know, we do one hundred and fifty percent coverage ratio. Um, that developer surplus is only part of the overall embedded value that we're creating in these projects. Um, we've we've issued in the neighborhood of twenty million of green bonds thus far, uh, and um, and I, I think that's a Canadian dollar number. Even this is U.S. dollars on this on this slide. Um, but my point being is there's there, there's there's a good amount of collateral available there um, in um, in in the pool. Actually, if I uh, if I if I just do some very rough sort of mental math, you know. 348 megawatts of backlog showed there. If um, if that embedded value on those projects was a dollar per watt, which uh, I think is is uh, on average probably a little bit conservative, that would mean you know 350 million USD of total package available. Mm -hmm. um, we we ratchet that down fairly significantly, but uh, but I, th I think you still get close to 100 million in terms of um, a potential collateral pool there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously a lot of collateral uh, available for for debt financing if if you so choose to do that, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And what what what's the cost of that type of capital? What I mean, 
is is it vulture debt type of capital or is it you know five six seven percent what kind of what's your cost of that capital well on the on the construction to term debt the 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 two portfolios that we closed this year um the, the two the two largest portfolios we closed this year one was at around 5.7 one was about 5.8 mm -hmm. percent um okay. the the now i'm forgetting which one was more recent but obviously not too much different between the two um so that you know that was in a, a higher rate environment i would say like more uh for that construction of term debt we're probably seeing more like high fives to mm -hmm. low low to mid sevens kind of depending on the type of project and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the on the green bond side of things uh the last few issuances we've done with a nine percent coupon um in the current rate environment we sold the last one at a, a at a five percent discount which uh, led to the yield being just just a little over ten percent i think ten point three um mm -hmm. but but yeah so your, to your question like we definitely uh we're i think we're, we're we're able to tap into sort of impact or esg oriented types mm -hmm. of capital I and mean, that's really the goal there and so um you know that's one of the main goals uh, that we're working on. Like uh, some of you would have would have met or or, uh, um, or or seen Sabrina on our team that joined us from Blackstone uh, close to three months ago now. Um, you know that's one of the main things that we're working on is building up those those connections and sources of capital with some of the foundations and family offices and things like that who you know mm -hmm. have good pool of capital that want to uh, want to invest for impact. Mm -hmm. So so clearly you have a lot of room to to sort of raise money or capital on the debt side. Um, you don't really see an urgency to, to raise any equity. Um, when when would you raise equity, or what, what's this environment that that you'd end up raising equity for? Well, I think the biggest thing is that just from like a uh, just from like the uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is like we think we're really undervalued in terms of our share price right now. So I think it would mm -hmm. be quite a bit more likely that we'd be aiming to buy back equity as opposed to. Mm -hmm. As opposed to issuing equity, just from from that perspective. So I think mm -hmm. you know your your direct question about when would we consider it. I think the pendulum would need to swing quite a bit the other direction. Like I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of growth opportunities out there. Um, we're obviously very happy with the growth that we showed on the earlier slides here. So you know we're we're heads down on uh, on, on on growing the team, growing the business, capturing more. But yeah, I think that uh, we would if we were if we were ever thinking about it from that perspective, it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, it would need to be a pretty significantly different uh, valuation discussion. So it's a price thing. It's a, you don't need you don't need equity raising, um, but if the price were a lot higher, it, it makes sense. Yeah, no, and yeah. just to say that in a different way, I mean, cash flow is starting to come out of the business as we mm -hmm. as we get to NTP on more projects, and so from that perspective, that obviously uh, shrinks the need considerably. Yes, feeling really good about our project financing sources from Green Bond all the way through to mm -hmm. uh, the 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 construction debt plus um or, you know the, the the bank debt plus the tax credits number mm -hmm. two, um and then like you know if if for some reason we needed to you know sell a project or something like that mm -hmm. you know I think that would be a much better source of capital as opposed to raising mm -hmm. equity anyway so I think you have to go mm -hmm. pretty far down the priority list to get to uh to get to you know raising equity yeah. for this you know, funding the business. Yeah. Um, remind everybody, how many shares are outstanding right now? Uh, pretty much 33 million on the nose. Uh, and yeah, and I'll, I'll say um, pretty much exactly a third of those are insider held. Okay. The vast majority of the insider ownership, um, we've, we have we signed a three-year voluntary lockup, um, uh, actually a, a second one. So we've been voluntarily mm -hmm. locked up for quite some time. Um, you, you'll see uh, insiders fairly routinely picking away at shares uh, when we're not mm -hmm. blackout period as well so yeah pr pretty strong insider ownership um and um uh, i think pretty strong shareholder base all overall pretty mm -hmm. tight flow mm -hmm. um where, where are your challenges right now i think it's that that flywheel slide that i showed and uh, not mm -hmm. to make anyone dizzy but if i um if i if i just uh flip back to there um you know i think for us that it's it's just this matter of um doing all the all doing all the right things to scale like i, I think that Right now, I feel we we stand toe to toe with any other uh, mid scale developer uh, developer of mid scale projects is what I refer to uh, in in this space. Like I think we're a really good developer, but at the same time, we just know that we can be so much better, right? So uh, refining all of our processes and um, and then systems to use things like that, so that we have more uh, more more timely execution, more timely development. And then the other side of that same coin is. Uh, being that much better at forecasting how long things are going to take to build investor mm -hmm. confidence to um, to you know continue to build those relationships with the lenders and tax equity and things like that. So mm -hmm. it is sort of like the 
the the non sexy side of scaling a business is is, is these types of operational things, um, yeah. and that's uh, that's uh, that's a big part of it. Um, and yeah, so it's it's you know I think that there's a, a from our from our backlog perspective the overall pipeline. Uh, it's it's really just like the time axis we're working across, like a mm -hmm. lot of confidence in the pro like the, the projects and markets um, that we're that we're developing, and it's just a matter of uh, doing that at pace. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you, you, you're you're micro cap in a micro cap world right now. What, what's the level of interest you're getting uh, for for you know from investors or institutional investors? What what's the landscape like for you right now? Well, I think that when uh, when people hear the story, I think it resonates quite well. Uh, I mm -hmm. think as, uh, as as you would be you know better place probably than, than myself to describe, it's been quiet out there. It's mm -hmm. uh, right. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. there, there hasn't been a lot of people coming in off the sidelines to find new stories to invest in. Um, I, I think yeah, I think when we've had the opportunity to tell the story, I think that it's I think it's resonated really well. It is a little bit complex, so I think it mm -hmm. like I think the, the people who spend the most time on it, I would say, are the ones that. Um, probably end up with the the you know the most conviction um, mm -hmm. in terms of where we're going. So it's something that um, it, people often take a little bit of time to really understand, like especially the cash flow story that we were just discussing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned institutional. You know, I think that that goes to um, the well, well, two things. One is obviously with the, the the market cap we have. There's only so many institutions that look down market to to, to this market cap, and and that's one of the challenges we all face. Um, but then number two is a good amount of our conversations, frankly, are actually around the green bond type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, there's only so many hours in the day, but maybe that also speaks a little bit to um, the market cap and so on is, uh, you know, some of the mar some of the sort of marketing budget, if you will, or, or time spent on marketing um, mm -hmm. is, is focused on that, that side. But we've had good success there. Like we've had... Um, uh, you know, a few energy, like a few energy funds, uh, some that, that typically do equity uh, take part in the green bond, some some uh, some fairly high profile family offices as well. So we're mm -hmm. getting some traction on that side. Mm -hmm. um, listen, I got some qu a couple questions that come in. Why don't we uh, jump in these questions and then um, I'll follow up with a few last questions. Uh, we've got one from Ad says, uh, Hi, Nick, is a recent debt raise the last one you will need before the company becomes cash flow positive? Can you provide any update on your ability to raise project debt to fund your projects? I and mean, we touched on that a little bit, but maybe is there anything else you want to add to it? Yeah, and just to reiterate a couple points, uh, hopefully concisely, is you know I think that there is these different stages, and we walked through that earlier. On the project side of things, we're still like it, it, there's there's a lot more capital as far as we can tell than there is projects. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, uh, two o'clock Eastern today it was like our weekly project finance call, and I know that the, our head of project financing made that comment about there being a lot more tax equity than projects, and um, we were negotiating uh, with a lender on a couple of projects a couple of weeks ago, and um, want to put a little more pressure on them. We've got another term sheet from another lender, like really quickly to, to put some pressure on it. So that project side of things, like still feeling really, really good. Um, and I think uh, you know, from a cost of capital perspective too, we're really pleased what we're seeing there. And then I think that that specific question was around, uh, probably around the green bond, um, mm -hmm. because we announced on Friday of last week, uh, a close for that. And I, and I should clarify, it was like the prospectus was cleared the actual closing of it is tomorrow. Um, so there will be another press release once that's closed, which um, mm -hmm. I certainly expect that to be tomorrow, but in case that causes it, anyone any confusion. Um, but um, the, uh, yeah, so, and so what I'll say on that is, you know, I just mentioned, we see good sources of capital. Um, we also see that as being a competitive source of capital for that type of, uh, that, that area of the project life cycle. So I think hypothetically, like someone shouldn't necessarily tie it with being cash flow positive because we could mm -hmm. be cash flow positive and say, hey, we have opportunities to grow further and, and see that as a good good source of capital. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll obviously be methodical in choosing how much to raise of that and when, um, you know, to the degree that we feel we need less, you know, hopefully that gives us more impetus to, to put down or pressure on rates, et cetera. But, but yeah, I don't want people to think, oh, you know, a green bond, green bond raise is bad, or that mm -hmm. means they, they need it. It, 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 it not, that's not totally the story, actually. It's like, hey, this gives us good, um, good, good dry powder to, to, to develop more projects or develop mm -hmm. these projects faster or whatever. So hopefully yeah. that helps. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, so next question is, is around something you just mentioned earlier. Any thoughts on selling projects to buy back stock, given your cheap share price? Um, I, I would just say, like, 
maybe give us a sense of like where you know public markets are valuing in a certain way but what what are projects worth right now and give us a, a sort of a a, a sense of uh, in numbers if you can in any way yeah so in terms of like what are projects worth now we are of course in different markets i'm looking mm -hmm. over at my right screen to see i don't have a slide directly in front of me that i can turn to but um and in uh, and maybe I'll, maybe on that note, just so we don't confuse anyone, I'll, I'll stop here for a second. I can bring it back up. But mm -hmm. um, the uh, on um, uh, yeah. So in terms of what projects sell for, so different markets have different different dynamics. Mm -hmm. I would say that generally speaking, uh, projects um, all in in U.S. dollars on a per watt basis, probably like three to four dollars per watt. Uh, maybe maybe two seventy five to four dollars, something like that, depending on the market. I think we're we're in a lot of good markets that that that. Uh, that are that are probably above the median in that regard. Um, so that's the type of type of valuation you're, you you see for projects. Um, and um, and and I know the I know the initial part of the question that the that the that the viewer asked Paul. I think you would ask it a little bit more too. Uh, sorry to ask you to. Well, it just that. just um, the the question originally was, does it make sense to sell a project to buy back stock? I mean, you guys are cheaper than what you could sell some of the assets for. So I, I can see where this question is coming from, right? Yeah, no, and I, I think that I, I think that question makes a lot of sense, frankly. Like, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, the 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 hedgehog concept to use another Jim Collins term, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of like uh, where we're focused as a company, right? I don't want to lose sight of that. Not that anybody yeah. would, but it's this full life cycle approach, building up the the portfolio, building up the flywheel, and seeing that uh, that turn into a real meaningful portfolio in the the quarters and years to come here. But in the short term, we do see this this pretty massive disconnect between where um, uh, where where we're being valued versus where we see the value of those projects. And so, you know, to that question, we would want to make sure that it didn't just, it didn't disrupt the business. We'd want to make sure that we sold the right projects at the right time, um, and uh, and so on. Um, we we have had some opportunities this year that uh, just just were just just outside the plate, um, and and so. We decided that it was better to to uh, to, to find the right one, um, but it's it's definitely something we're very mindful of. And uh, I think you know we've 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 done a, a good amount of um, reading and so on 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 capital allocation and and thinking about you know what it means for shareholders long term and should this should this uh, uh, disconnect maintain uh, mm -hmm. between between you know the value of our portfolio versus the value of the stock. I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense to uh, to invest in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I obviously that, that's that's a long-term option you have. If the market doesn't right-size itself, then uh, you've got avenues to sort of uh, self-right-size yourselves. That's that's pretty interesting. Um, another question that came in: are, are you seeing delays in regulatory processes to get to projects to NTP? The uh, yeah, on regulatory side of things, you know, two things. One is there's this interconnection landscape that gets talked about a fair bit um, for, mm -hmm. for multiple reasons, but that is the, the, the high pull in the tent on, on developing projects generally, whether that be mid-scale or utility scale, solar or wind or battery storage mm -hmm. or what have you. It's working with grid operators to get permission to connect to the grid. Um, and, uh, and as the growth of solar has been exponential in recent years, mm -hmm. Um, that that that's that's front and center. Now, uh, FERC, the the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, you know, they did pass uh, um, something earlier this year. One way to streamline it. I know there's a lot of work going into streamlining that further. Um, because it's the high pole in the tent, you will see, including UGE, we'll we'll lobby uh, to 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 try to get improvements to regulations. And part of that lobbying mm -hmm. process is to talk to journalists about how 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 bad interconnection is. Right. Um, but but you know there's a there's an agenda that we have there to try to refine these rules and make things uh, make things smoother. We're only going to you know complete the energy transition um, if if interconnection can be a bit quicker. So you know we are in the same landscape that other people are. You know that said, we focus on mid scale projects in part because they interconnect faster than utility scale. Mm -hmm. um, and and so you know and I think that that flywheel that we talked about earlier that's that's one aspect of it. It's just getting better and better over time at finding those places where we can connect faster. Um, or ways to connect a project faster and, and, and so on. So anyway, interconnection, we're working mm -hmm. with it. Midscale is a good place to be um, in terms of that interconnection timeline. So excited from that perspective. And then I'll just mention on the other side of regulatory, there is you know some states that we're, we're in and, and mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California, 
where there's been regulatory work that's been happening, not quite at the pace that we wanted to, um, but um, but but I think in time. Like for example, New Jersey's community solar program, uh, the 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 application opened yesterday, uh, and so that's a that's a state that we're we're super excited about. California will be next, I think, and then Pennsylvania. So you know, it government never moves uh, lightning fast, but mm -hmm. but you know, I think if you take a step back, there's a tremendous amount of movement happening here. Mm -hmm. Um. So, I mean, you explained a couple of things that we should watch out for. As as investors, where do you think the the biggest focus should be? Maybe, maybe what metrics should we really pay the most attention to? You mentioned cash flow. Is there anything else that we should be really paying attention to? And, and is there any other catalyst you think that uh, we should look forward to? Well, I, I think in the the, uh, the 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 NTP milestones, COD milestones. I know people mm -hmm. are watching it. They're right to. I, I think that those are those are really really important. I think those are the most important part of our pipeline and backlog. Like, you know, we'll 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 continue to win new projects and so on. So we're excited for that. And I don't want to downplay that in any way. You know, we want to mm -hmm. we want to get to gigawatt scale by the end of this decade. So mm -hmm. um, so that's good. But in the you know, rest of 23, throughout 24, there'll be a lot of focus starting to see those come through when expected um and, and in a in a more frequent basis. So that's that's important. Um and then um, you know, I, I think that. It, it sorry yeah the cash flow absolutely mm -hmm. and, and like I mentioned we'll uh, we'll, we'll keep looking to refine um, our messaging pull forward some of the important points there and then number three is uh, to say it the third time um, the, the less sexy part of scaling right is like all these refinements yeah. we're, we're, we're 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 making um, to uh, to you know to build a you know really long standing company here and so. Internally, we're, we're super excited about that work that we're, we're doing. Um, last week, for example, we had our first uh, company offsite uh, since before the pandemic to get everyone together and, and work through some of these things in your, your in, in real time. And um, a lot of you know, a lot of enthusiasm and, and, and so on that was that was shared there. So yeah, I think that you know, I think if um, maybe maybe the other side of that last point that I'm trying to mention is you know as we go through that, um, there's were maybe just to say it, you know, and I know like sometimes timelines have been have been shifted in the past, right? And I know that's 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 been uh, uncomfortable. Um, but um, but at the same time, we are scaling so much. We're going to continue to scale a lot, and we're going to get a lot better at forecasting, so we meet meet expectations going forward. And it's not going to be snapping mm -hmm. the fingers, but I know that we're making really good progress towards um, you know that that dependability. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, I mean, we covered a lot. Uh, have we missed anything? <laughs> from, uh, from there's my, always from more my, yeah yeah no i think from my perspective that's great i, I think uh you know high, high level of course and um as as uh as many of you would know uh you know we're always here for for questions and so on um and um you know people can reach out anytime yeah perfect we we have got one last question coming in late here um uh nick are you looking at acquisitions increase your revenue per project small battery storage companies or other grid connecting software for vpp anything like that yeah yeah, and you know some of that is, um, you know, there's an M and A side of things, there's a project acquisition side of things, and there's just a technology and and, and partnership side of things. Um, I think that the, you know, we've um, on the on the project acquisition side of things to start there. You know, uh, people who follow the story know that we've acquired a couple projects in the past um, twelve or eighteen months. Um, we're um, I'd say we're a lot more focused on bringing our own projects through right now. Like, hey, opportunistically. Uh, there might be some things to to add to the portfolio, but um, we really want to prove out to everybody, uh, you know, how how well we're doing with our own development here. So uh, project acquisition will be really selective. Company acquisition, you know, hey, if the right opportunity came about, um, then, uh, then 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 perhaps. But really believe in what we're doing here, and so from that from that perspective, it's it's more a matter of again, uh, you know, uh, just to put numbers on it, right? Like the. The, the gross value of the backlog right now is in the billion dollar USD type of range. We're up, uh, we don't remember the number we said earlier, 40 something million Canadian market cap. So mm -hmm. we know that if we stick to our knitting and just bring yeah. these things through, um, there's a tremendous amount of upside and cash flow and so on. So those other things really need to be the right fit. We're going to be really yeah. selective. And then just on the last one about technology and partnerships, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're always looking to continue to refine things. We're in a dynamic space. Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I think it's all additive to the, the hedgehog concept that we have, the, the, the flywheel that we're spinning, whatever other Jim Collins, uh, uh <laughs> lots of Jim Collins today. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> That's perfect. 
Uh, well, listen, last, last chance, um, as far as a key takeaway, what, what's the key message you want to make sure everybody walks away with today, Nick? Yeah, I think that there's a tremendous amount of upside as uh, those those high level numbers that we just mentioned. I think there's a really, really good team and, and, and platform in place to bring these projects forth. Um, I know that some people worry about availability of capital and we're not seeing it. We're seeing a tremendous amount of capital out there in the space. And um, and so from that perspective, we'll, uh, you know, we'll just keep motoring through and, and excited for the growth that we're, we're experiencing here. Fantastic. Well, listen, we've been uh, speaking with um, Nick Blitterswick, CEO of UGE International. Um, Nick, it's always great to catch up. We'll look forward to catching up with you uh, in not too distant future. Sounds good. Thanks again, Paul. Take care. You bet. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. All right. I uh, don't know where Trevor went. I see we're still recording, Trev. Hey, Paul. Trev, sorry Trev, about that. Yeah. There you go. No Trev's worries. grabbing a snack. You were uh, eating a sandwich. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead. You're you're good to go. Uh, did you did you turn it back on again, or you wanna? I didn't stop recording. Here, I'll just okay.